there, Coletta Stick. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's Trass and the Tira lecture. I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Pat Sheehan uh, for this evening's lecture. Pat is an MLA, uh, so he's a member of the Legislative Assembly in Northern Ireland, where he represents the Sinn Féin party. Prior to joining the Assembly, Pat spent uh, just over 18 years in prison. During his time in prison, Pat himself participated in the 1981 hunger strike, where he personally went 55 days without food and where uh, 10 of his comrades uh, died. Uh, many would argue that the 1981 hunger strike actually laid the foundations uh, stone for our Good Friday Agreement um, and indeed led to the peace that we all enjoy in Ireland today. So over to you, Ta Falter, Moore, Roche, Padraig, and off you go, all yours. Or Margaret, Falter of Ahandana and Shawnacht, you're all very welcome uh, here tonight. Um, I'm going to tell you the history of the 1980-81 hunger strike and the prison protest from, from 1976 up to 1981. Uh, I'm going to talk about the, the history and the politics of it and I'm also going to weave through it all my own personal experiences uh, of that time. So I suppose, and I, I, I apologise first of all, I, I'm, I'm not sure uh, where the audience are all from. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I suppose I better start with the, the history of of hunger striking in Ireland. And I suppose as long as Irish Republicans have been in prisons, uh, they have uh, invariably used the weapon of hunger strike uh, from time to time. And the whole idea of, of hunger striking or the rationale behind it is to bring moral pressure to bear on the your opponent uh, or your enemy who you believe has inflicted an injustice on you. And it's a moral pressure uh, to try and get that uh, opponent to retract that injustice. Uh, and that's sort of the rationale of, of hunger striking. And I suppose the most famous, before Bobby Sands, the most famous hunger striker to die was Terence McSweeney who was the mayor of Cork City, who died back in uh, 1920, I think it was. Somebody might correct me on that date. But in any event, let's jump forward then to the early 1970s. And as a result of the conflict erupting here in 1969 uh, and the unrest that ensued after that period, many Republicans found themselves in prison. And as always, when Republicans found themselves in prison, they demanded to be treated as political prisoners or prisoners of war. And in 1972, I suppose at the, at the height of the conflict here in the North, uh, there was a hunger strike in Belfast prison or Crumlin Road prison as we would know it better, uh, which ended before anyone actually became very seriously ill. The, the demand was to be recognized as political prisoners and the British government conceded uh, what was known as special category status. And special category status was political status in everything but name. Prisoners were allowed to wear their own clothes they didn't have to do prison work. Uh, they were allowed to associate uh, with their own comrades uh, and be segregated from the, the rest of the prison population. And by and large, they were able to organize their own life within the prison. Their command structure within the prison was recognized by the prison regime uh, and uh, the prisoners organized their lives around education, uh, history lectures, learning the Irish language, uh, and so on. And, and uh, uh, 
uh, they of course plotted and planned on how to escape from prison as well. So uh, most prisoners were then moved to Long Cash Prison, which was also an internment camp, which the British had opened when they introduced internment in, in August 1971, uh, when, when uh, Republicans were thrown into prison without any due process, without any trial. Uh, and the British established in the same prison uh, uh, a, a number of compounds or cages for the Republican sentenced prisoners who had been sentenced through the courts. So shortly after that, the British government then developed a strategy which was aimed at defeating the IRA and defeating the Republican struggle. And it was a three-pronged strategy. It was normalization, austerization, and criminalization. And normalization was simply an attempt to seal off what the British saw as the troublesome areas in the North, uh, keep uh, people who might be going to cause trouble hemmed in. And they also put rings of steel round uh, cities and towns to try and ensure that life carried on as normal. Uh, of course, it wasn't very successful and the IRA on many, of, many occasions were able to penetrate whatever uh, checkpoints or rings of steel that were erected. Uh, Ulsterization was similar to what the Americans had done in Vietnam. The difficulty for any government fighting a foreign war is that quite often it doesn't have the support of its citizens at home. They maybe don't support it or don't understand it. Uh, and so when uh, soldiers are being killed, it becomes a source of unpopularity for the government who's responsible for the war. So what the Americans did in Vietnam was to withdraw their own troops from the front line and recruit uh, locals to fight in the front line. So they recruited them and trained them uh, and sent them out to fight in place of American soldiers. So that if a Vietnam, Vietnamese soldier was being killed, it didn't even register in the United States. And similarly here, it was unpopular in Britain when British soldiers were being killed on the streets of Belfast or South Armagh or Derry or wherever. Uh, so what the British hoped to do was to recruit locals to engage in the fight against the IRA. Uh, they beefed up the RUC, which was the, the paramilitary police force at the time, which is 99% unionist. Uh, often described as the armed wing of unionism. And the Ulster Defence Regiment, which was a, a particularly notorious and brutal uh, regiment of the British Army, uh, which was totally infiltrated by loyalist paramilitaries from the UDA, the Ulster Defence Association, and the Ulster Volunteer Force. Uh, and uh, the third prong, of course, which affected us in the prisons was criminalization and what they aimed to do and they briefed their diplomats throughout the world uh, was to portray the conflict here as some sort of criminal conspiracy and to that end they began using terminology uh, which was associated with criminality when they were talking about the IRA about the leaders of the IRA and the Republican struggle so they talked about godfathers and about mafia uh, and they spread propaganda about the IRA being involved in criminality. The difficulty for them with that particular prong of the strategy was that there were political prisoners in the prisons who had been given recognition as political prisoners by the British government. So they needed to change that and they, deci they, they decided that from the 1st of March 1976 Anyone who went through the process of 
interrogation centres uh, and the no Diplock uh, or the no the no jury Diplock courts, and who was sentenced, would go to another new prison within Long Cash. Long Cash had been divided down the middle. Uh, uh, a 30 foot wall had been built right down the middle of the camp and the new prison uh, was built there uh, known as the H blocks uh, and there were eight H blocks and they were called H blocks because of the shape of them. They were the, the shape of the letter H and they were built for maximum control. So on one side of the wall you had political prisoners and on the other side of the wall uh, you had prisoners who the British were trying to portray as criminals. And the British thought that if they could get the prisoners to accept this status as criminals, it would have such a demoralizing impact on the Republican struggle on the outside that they could uh, move in and effectively mop up uh, what was left uh, of the struggle. So, uh, while they th thought that the prisoners were the soft underbelly of the struggle and they could break them, use the prisons as a breaker's yard effectively, uh, they all underestimated the resolve of Republican prisoners at that time. And the first prisoner to be sentenced under the new regime was a man called Keir Nugent. And he was taken into a cell uh, stripped naked and told to put on a prison uniform. And he famously said to the prison guards, uh, if you want me to wear that uniform, you're going to have to nail it to my back. And he was then thrown into an empty cell uh, uh, in which there were three blankets. And he took one of those blankets to cover his nakedness. And that then became known as the blanket protest. And hundreds of other Republican prisoners were sentenced and joined the blanket protest. And they were in cells 24 seven. They didn't get exercise outside. They didn't get any fresh air. They had no access to reading material, no access to radios or television or the outside world uh, at all. Uh, and that was how the regime continued uh, for a number of years. The prisoners eventually decided, as a result of the brutality that was taking place in the H-blocks, that they needed to let the outside world know what was happening within the prison. And they decided to take uh, the visit a month that they were entitled to. However, to uh, get that visit, they had to wear the prison uniform. Uh, but it was decided that in order to let the outside world know what was happening, that that was a necessary compromise that we would have to take. Uh, and that's, that's what we did. Uh, and quite often then the, the brutality increased because the guards decided they would inflict very degrading and humiliating searches on us when we were going out to and coming back from the visits. And uh, it's funny, uh, we, we existed in a very brutal uh, regime uh, where, where beatings and ill treatment were the order of the day. But it was strange that uh, it's, I never knew of a situation where a prison guard came up and beat a prisoner without some sort of spurious excuse in the first place. So for example, uh, when we were coming back from our visits, uh, the, the prison guard who was with us would have a small booklet and in that booklet would be our photograph and uh, all our details, name, address, date of birth, uh, so on and so forth, as well as any distinguishing marks such as uh, scars or tattoos or anything like that. But the prison guards, uh, when we were coming back from the visits, 
would ask for our prison number. Uh, and we had taken a decision that we wouldn't give our prison number, uh, that as far as we were concerned, we were human beings, we had names, and if the prison guards wanted our names, then we were more than happy uh, to give them any of that information. But of course, they didn't want it. They wanted an excuse to lay into us, and that's what they did. And the, the place became even, uh, e even more brutal as the time went on. Um, and ironically, when we were in prison, the place we felt safest was in our cells. But uh, we sometimes had to leave our cells. So, for example, there were no toilets or ablutions in, in the cells. We had one small chamber pot and, and a container for water, uh, and that was it. And uh, we were at the mercy of the, of the prison guards to get out to the toilet, for example, to get out and get washed or brush our teeth or, or anything like that. Uh, and again, every time we left ourselves, we were at the mercy uh, of the prison guards. Uh, and depending what time of day it was, they might be sober or drunk. Uh, there was a, there was a, a, a club in the, within the confines of the prison, within the perimeter wall of the prison. Uh, which the prison guards often used to rush out to at lunchtime and then come back on to the wing later on, uh, half jarred uh, and, and looking for blood. So those were the sort of conditions we were enduring. And uh, we decided then that we would not go out of our cells unless we absolutely had to. So we began throwing our own bodily waste uh, out the windows of the cells. And uh, the prison staff then began literally uh, to begin shoveling it back into the cells again. And, and this was the beginning of what uh, became known as the no wash protest. So we didn't go out to the ablutions. Uh, we didn't ask to get out to use the toilet. Uh, and when the screws began shoveling our own excrement back into the cells, uh, we began smearing it on the walls. So we were living in, in pretty horrendous conditions. Uh, we, had, we were naked in the cells, apart from the blankets that we used to cover ourselves. We had a, a thin piece of foam rubber as a mattress on the floor. Uh, and we had one chamber pot and one container for water. And apart from that, we had nothing else uh, within the cells. And uh, we poured our urine out the doors and we smeared our excrement uh, on the walls. And those were the conditions uh, we existed in for a number of years. I. Uh, I went into prison at the very start of 1978 and I was sentenced at the start of 79 and that was when I uh, joined the, the prison protest. Uh, I arrived in, in H4. I uh, was taken into a cell and told to put on a uniform uh, and I refused to do so and my clothes were taken from me and I was uh, brought to a cell uh, at the far end of the wing. So those were the conditions we were living in. Uh, a hunger strike had been spoken about uh, on many occasions up to this, but, you know, many people thought it was just talk or that the, the, the protest would at some stage be resolved. Uh, however, as time went on, it became clear that the British had no intentions of resolving the prison protest. And in late 1980, uh, the leader of the prisoners at that time, Brenton uh, Hughes, asked for volunteers for a hunger strike. Uh, and I put my name forward for that hunger strike. However, I wasn't uh, chosen 
as one of the first contingent. Seven, seven men were chosen to begin hunger strike simultaneously in October 1980. And that hunger strike continued for 53 days. Uh, by that time, uh, Sean McKenna had become very critically ill and had lapsed into a coma. And a representative from the British government came into the prison hospital and spoke to Brenton Hughes and convinced him that if the hunger strike ended, that the British government would move quickly to resolve the issues in an honourable way so that no one would lose face. Uh, so Brenton was faced uh, with a decision to make and he ordered medical intervention for Sean McKenna and the hunger strike ended uh, in, in December, just shortly before Christmas in 1980. However, uh, the British government then reneged on the commitment they had given. Uh, it had just been a verbal commitment. There was nothing on paper, uh, a gentleman's agreement. Uh, but the British were of the view that they had been victorious, that they had defeated the prisoners, and there were no concessions going to be, to be made uh, whatsoever. So by this stage, um, Bobby Sands had taken over as our officer in command in the hitch blocks. And he decided that another hunger strike would be necessary. Uh, and again, he asked for volunteers. And, and I again put my name forward for that hunger strike. This time it was going to be different. Uh, Bobby had decided that he would lead the hunger strike out on his own. And he would be joined two weeks later by another volunteer and then shortly after that, by another two volunteers. And as each prisoner died, they would be replaced by another volunteer. So I had volunteered uh, for that hunger strike. Uh, it, wasn't, it was never an easy decision to, to make, to put your name forward to go on, on hunger strike. Uh, I suppose, and... It was made all the more difficult uh, for me just shortly before uh, Bobby commenced his hunger strike on the 1st of March, 1981. I had, a, I had a visit with my mother and father and my sister Louise, who, who was a year older than me. Uh, at that time, she would have just turned uh, 24. Uh, it was February. That was the month her, her birthday was, and I was 22, coming on 23 in May. And at the, it was, it was just a normal visit, but at the end of the visit, my father hung back a bit and as my sister and my mother walked out. And he said to me, I want you to take your name off the list of volunteers for the hunger strike. He says, Louise has been diagnosed with leukemia and has been given five or six years to live. So uh, you can imagine I was absolutely devastated by that news. It was the first time there'd been any bad news like that in my immediate family. Uh, and I have to say my head was spinning. There was no time for any further discussion uh, with my father. At that time, when the visit ended, that was it over and done with quickly in the the prison guards would move in to shepherd the visitors out as quickly as possible. So I went back to my cell and obviously gave it much thought. And, and I came to the conclusion that uh, everyone in the H blocks at that time uh, probably had a sad story of some sort uh, in their family. Uh, Bobby Sands had a, uh, an eight-year-old son. Uh, uh, others uh, had children as well who later died on hunger strike. And uh, I decided that I would uh, leave my name on the list. 
and and I suppose when you're young, you don't really reflect on uh, some of the big decisions you make in your youth, uh, and and I suppose later on reflection, um, there was absolutely nothing was going to change my mind anyway, uh, and I came to the conclusion that when you make a decision to go on hunger strike. You have to be, your, 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 your psyche has to be so uh, strong that there, you, you almost put a psychological defense shield around yourself so that it doesn't matter whether you get good news or bad news, it doesn't penetrate that shield that you have put up. And it's like tunnel vision, uh, in, in a sense, uh, going on hunger strike is is simple and straightforward. You have one job to do, uh, and you can't allow anything to deflect you from doing that job. And that's the frame of mind that you have to be in. And and, and I've no doubt that's the frame of mind that Bobby Sands and and the others who died on hunger strike were were also in. So I kept uh, I kept my name on the list for volunteers. And then Bobby began his hunger strike on the 1st of March, uh, 1981. Uh, so uh, the, the campaign was building up. We had been on a bit of a downer after the first hunger strike and the way it ended. Uh, and we had been trying to build momentum again to try and get the people back out on the streets to support this second hunger strike. And uh, it's funny often the way events that no one have anticipated or had anticipated uh, uh, comes to impinge on the events of the day. And one of the most significant events uh, in the history of the last 50 or 60 years uh, took place while Bobby Sands was on hunger strike in April 1981. The sitting MP for Fermanagh, South Tyrone, had died suddenly. And the unionists, believing that they could win a by-election, moved a writ in Westminster for a by-election to be held. Now, what, what's significant uh, about this particular period was that Republicans didn't contest elections. They weren't involved in the, in the electoral process. Uh, and uh, Sinn Féin existed almost as a, as a support organization for the army uh, rather than a, a mainstream political party. And the reason Republicans didn't contest elections was that, first of all, many believed that by entering into the electoral or political process, you would have to compromise your political principles. But the main reason for not contesting elections in the North was that the uh, electoral system had been rigged uh, from the foundation of the state. The state had been established on the basis of a gerrymandered sectarian headcount that created a perpetual or permanent majority for unionism. And for the 50 years of the existence of the unionist regime, it was effectively a one party state. And those nationalists who did participate in that particular uh, uh, parliament succeeded only in ever having one piece of legislation enacted. And that was about the protection of wild birds, nothing to do with improving the conditions of the nationalist community. Uh, ending discrimination and sectarianism and so on. So Republicans believed that there was no point engaging in the electoral process because there was no benefit to be had from it. However, when the by-election was announced, uh, there was a suggestion that Bobby Sands should stand as a candidate, as an anti-H-Block Armagh candidate. And a uh, debate ensued within the movement about whether that would be the right thing to do or not. 
Uh, and as history shows, it was decided that Bobby would stand in the election. Now, you have to remember, at this time, Maggie Thatcher, who was the British Prime Minister, had been saying, uh, the prisoners have no support and the IRA have no support. And if Bobby Sands had lost that election, no doubt she would have been crowing, even your own people don't support you. But again, as history shows, Bobby Sands uh, won that election in a straight fight with uh, the unionist candidate, Harry West. And, uh, you know, that was an absolutely historic day. It was front page news uh, around the world. You know, in the days before social media and 24 hour news stations and so on and so forth, the election of Bobby Sands as a member of the, of the British Parliament was the single biggest news story on that day back in April uh, 1981. And what it did was that it, it convinced many Republicans uh, that there was benefit to be had from engaging in the electoral process, especially if you were successful. And of course, not long after that, Sinn Féin began contesting elections uh, and went from, from strength to strength after that. But I, I, I'll maybe go on to that uh, later. Uh, in, in any event, uh, many people thought Bobby's election would save his life, that the British government would move to uh, resolve the prison issue after that. Uh, I mean, if there, was, if there was one thing that showed the prisoners in the hitch blocks were political, it was the fact that, you know, they engaged in the political process and people came out and elected them. Uh, and uh, of course it didn't save Bobby's life. And when Kieran Doherty, who was also a hunger striker, was elected in the general election in the South in June of that year, he also died uh, as a TD, uh, a member of the, of, the, of the Dublin Parliament. So um, Bobby died. Uh, after him, Frank Hughes died, uh, and then Raymond McCreesh and Patsy O'Hara uh, also died. At this stage, uh, I was, I, I was uh, sort of willing to be called uh, at some stage as a replacement on the hunger strike, uh, and I hadn't heard any word. Uh, and. I suppose there was quite a long hiatus uh, between Patsy O'Hara and Raymond dying right up until uh, July. Uh, and then more deaths and, and, and ensued after that. Uh, and uh, by the time coming towards the end of July, I wrote to Bick McFarlane and Bick had taken over from Bobby Sands as ROC our commander in the prison at that time. And I wrote the back and, and uh, explained that I had been expecting to be called at some stage as a replacement in the, on the hunger strike and that I hadn't received any communications uh, from anyone. And Bick wrote back to me and, uh, and, and when I say I wrote the back, I mean, I wrote a, a very small note that was wrapped in stretch and seal. It was smuggled outside the prison and then smuggled back in again uh, by someone on, on Bick's wing uh, and Bick eventually got it. And he wrote back to me uh, and he said that, uh, that they had heard uh, about my sister's illness. Uh, and as a consequence, many, many, some people believed that psychologically I wouldn't be up to going on hunger strike. And I wrote back to Beck and told him, uh, listen, uh, what, whatever about uh, my sister, I'm ready here to go on hunger strike uh, at any time. So uh, these exchanges were taking place 
probably around this time, uh, late July, early, uh, early August, uh, and after Kieran Doherty died, I received uh, communication uh, from the leadership of the army on the outside, uh, and it was addressed to volunteer uh, Pat Sheehan. And uh, I had always been proud, uh, and, and still am proud, to have been a volunteer in the Irish Republican Army. And uh, it was the first time I had ever seen volunteer in, in front of my name. And initially, you know, I was pleased about that. Uh, I was proud to see it. Although when I, when I reflected on it later, usually the only time you see volunteer in front of anyone's name is on a, a headstone in a cemetery or in the obituary columns in the papers. But in any event, uh, the com, the letter that I had received uh, said, uh, you have volunteered uh, to go on hunger strike. Uh, by doing so, you will be bringing uh, the movement and the direct confrontation with the enemy. If uh, you have any second thought, step aside now and nothing less will be thought of you. However, if you decide to go ahead with this, you will be dead within two months. So, and it was as stark as that uh, uh, and uh, you think you have all the angles covered, you know, in terms of your own mental and psychological preparation uh, for hunger strike. But when you see it in black and white in front of you, you'll be dead in two months. Not you might be dead or there's a chance you'll be dead. It was as stark as you will be dead in two months. And uh, if you have any second thoughts, step aside now and nothing less will be thought of you. Now, did I have any second thoughts? Well, when you're heading into uncharted territory like that, somewhere where you have never been before, it's difficult, I would say, for anyone to be absolutely 100% sure they would be able to go through with it. Uh, However, I was as sure as I could be uh, that I would see it through to the death if necessary. So <clears throat> I began my hunger strike on the 10th of August, uh, 1981. And I remained on hunger strike for the next 55 days until the 3rd of October, when the decision was taken to end the hunger strike. I didn't have any input into that decision making. Uh, that decision was taken by the leadership uh, in the prison. But just to give you a, a sort of idea of, of, of what it's like being on hunger strike. I mean, first of all, in the first few days or a couple of weeks, uh, I mean, obviously you're very hungry. As time goes on, you get very cold, you're losing weight, uh, drinking a lot of water. Uh, and then initially one day you stand up and you're lightheaded uh, and you begin to feel just gradually weaker and weaker. Uh, you're examined by the doctor every day. Uh, he takes your blood pressure, uh, your tests your urine uh, and various other uh, vital signs are, are, are tested and you're weighed uh, every day. So, and, and that went on uh, for, I was in the, in, in the block for over 30 days and then I was transferred to the prison hospital. Uh, there we were allowed to receive newspapers and, and also to have a radio in the cell at that time. So, uh, 
one of the uh, I, I explained the, the 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 rationale about hunger striking is to put the spotlight on your opponent, as shine a spotlight on the injustice that you believe has been inflicted on you, and keep keep the pressure firmly on your opponent. But what happened then uh, during the hunger strike was that, and the, the law as it stood at the time was that if anyone lapses into unconsciousness, their next of kin can order medical intervention. And one of the hunger strikers lapsed into unconsciousness. He was very critically ill and his mother uh, ordered medical intervention to save his life. And what that did was that it shifted the spotlight away from the British government uh, onto the families. It was the families then who came under pressure. Uh, they were, uh, the media were camped outside their houses, asking them, were they going to allow their sons to die? They came under pressure from the churches and from uh, political opponents of, of Republicans uh, not to allow their sons to die. So all this, all, all, all the pressure was on them. Uh, the spotlight was on them. And in a sense, the whole dynamic in the hunger strike shifted and it shifted away from the British uh, onto the families. And by this stage, uh, I was becoming uh, quite seriously ill. Uh, my I was uh, yellow with jaundice. Uh, about uh, the hunger strike ended on a on a on a Saturday. On the previous Wednesday, I had been examined by a doctor from the city hospital in Belfast. They used to send a consultant in every week uh, to examine us, as well as the ordinary prison doctors examining examining us every day. And he asked me to lie back flat on the bed. And he pushed his fingers uh, gently up under my rib cage on the right hand side. And I nearly jumped off the bed in pain. And he says, uh, your liver has become enlarged. It's, it's starting to shut down. Uh, and he went on to say that even if I ended my hunger strike there and then, uh, he couldn't guarantee that I would survive. So, uh, but I explained to you earlier, I had this psychological shield around myself. Uh, it didn't, whether, didn't matter whether I got good news or bad news. It didn't matter whether there were rumors of a, uh, of, a, of an impending resolution of the hunger strike uh, in the media or whether it was a doctor telling me I was going to die soon. Uh, it didn't matter. Uh, I, I had my mind fixed on what I had to do and, and I was going to do it. And uh, uh, one of the difficulties with hunger striking is that because of the deprivation of a particular vitamin, the muscle that controls movement in the eye becomes weak and the eyes can no longer focus. Uh, and what happens is that your eyes are constantly moving up and down. And it's, it's one of the doctors described to me as being very similar to seasickness. So you become nauseous, uh, you begin vomiting up the water. Uh, you can no longer keep the water down. And that's when the deterioration process in the hunger strike really begins to accelerate. Uh, you're effectively on hunger and thirst strike when that begins to happen. <clears throat> so by the time Saturday, the 3rd of October arrived, uh, I, was, I weighed about seven and a half stone. Uh, I was almost totally blind. I could make out ships coming into the room, but I couldn't have identified people. Uh, and I was just constantly vomiting up green bile. 
and the uh, the decision had been taken to end the hunger strike. Uh, I had a I had a meeting with Bick. Bick had a re, uh, had arranged a meeting uh, in the prison hospital with me, and he came up to tell me that the hunger strike was ending. Uh, and he asked me, did I think I'd be able to hang on until the Saturday? And uh, I told him what the consultant had said. And he said, well, I mean, if, if you want to come off the hunger strike now, I mean, go ahead. There's, there's absolutely no problem with that. And I said, Bick, I'll come off this hunger strike when I'm ordered off it and I'm not coming off it until then. So uh, that was okay. We left it at that and the decision had been taken that we would end the hunger strike at 3 p.m. on the following day, Saturday, the 3rd of October. And uh, I, I convinced myself that if I was able to stay awake all night, uh, I would be able to keep myself alive just by sheer willpower. Uh, and as it turned out, uh, I got the best night's sleep of the whole hunger strike. So uh, I don't know about willpower, but uh, I woke up the next morning still alive anyway. Uh, and at 3 p.m. that day, all the other hunger strikers, some who were already in the hospital with me at that time, and others who had been still in the blocks, who had only recently joined the hunger strike, uh, were all brought into my cell in the prison hospital. And at 3 p.m. that day, I called in the chief medical officer and told him that we were terminating the hunger strike. Uh, and that ended um, probably uh, the most significant uh, period in, in, in the history of this uh, island, probably since the 1916 raising, uh, and probably the, the period that has uh, had the most impact in terms of the years after. Uh, I mean, I've already uh, illustrated um, our, our, our told the story of Bobby being elected uh, as an MP in, in 1981. And Sinn Féin then began to contest elections uh, and went from strength to strength after that. And I mean, I firmly believe that the, the seeds of the peace process were planted in that period in 1981 uh, during the hunger strike. Because remember, the criminalization policy was about uh, marginalizing and defeating the Republican struggle. But what the hunger strike succeeded in doing was the complete opposite of that. Uh, uh, the hunger strikers inspired many young people to come and join in the struggle. Uh, many people came to join the IRA and Sinn Féin Sinn Féin grew in strength and strength. And you have to remember, at this stage, the British military had already accepted that they couldn't uh, militarily defeat the IRA. The political establishment was well behind. And I suppose it was only in the late 1980s and early 90s that the political establishment began to come to the same conclusion that the IRA couldn't be defeated. Uh, they had tried everything uh, to do it militarily, uh, torture, internment camps, shoot to kill, criminalization, marginalization, isolation, and none of it had worked. And there was only one option left to them. And that was negotiations. And that, uh, the, the, the negotiations and the ending of the armed conflict, in my view, came out of the hunger strikes of 1981. And the British finally realized that they weren't going to defeat the Republican struggle. Uh, and, and 
uh, I suppose uh, jumping back again, uh, I made a full recovery uh, uh, immediately after the hunger strike. I was given two vitamin injections. One was a multivitamin injection and the other one was specifically for the vitamin in the eyes. It was it's one of the B vitamins. I forget which one it is now. And probably uh, within an hour, the nausea had disappeared and my eyesight had returned almost, not completely, but almost back to normal. And I was taken out to Musgrave Park Hospital to the military wing where there was a, a secure ward for prisoners. Uh, and there were uh, three other former hunger strikers there, Pat McGeown, Bernard Fox and Neil McCluskey. And uh, I was the fourth. And uh, the first thing I got after the hunger strike, um, the nurses, uh, the doctor and the nurse came in with uh, a small glass of, of what looked like milk. Uh, and they said to me, this is actually half milk and half water. If you can keep this down, we'll give you as much as you want. If you can't keep it down, uh, we'll have to put you on a drip. So I lifted the glass uh, and took a sip. And only uh, they told me that uh, it was half water. I wouldn't have believed them. Uh, it was the sweetest, uh, most beautiful thing that you could ever imagine uh, passing your lips. It was like a nectar from the gods. So uh, I was able to keep it down uh, and then I was able to drink uh, as much milk as I wanted after that. And, and by the next day, uh, I was on solid food. And, and within four weeks, uh, I was back in the, in the hitch blocks again. So I think I'll leave it there. I think it might be spoken for long enough. And I'll take any questions that uh, you want to ask. And, and feel free to ask whatever you want. Uh, don't, don't be concerned about me being sensitive to personal questions or anything. Feel free to ask what you want. Thanks so much, Pat. Uh, that was a very informative lecture. Really enjoyed it. Uh, very personal, very engaging. Uh, I've a question here from Aaron. Uh, how were the prisoners, what, what was the prisoners' morale like, really, when the choice was made to go on a second strike, hunger strike, after the first one being unsuccessful? Well, you, you can imagine in the immediate aftermath of the of the first hunger strike, uh, and, and and I forgot to mention I was actually on that hunger strike for five days. Five days before it ended, uh, there were twenty seven or twenty eight of us called, uh, and and we all joined that hunger strike as well as three women from Armagh who Armagh prison who had joined the hunger strike at the start of December. Uh, among among those three women was Maria Farrell, who was later shot dead by the SAS in Gibraltar. Uh, but uh, there was there was demoralisation afterwards because we thought in the initial ending of the hunger strike that there would be a resolution, and it turned out uh, that there wasn't. Uh, Bobby. Bobby had entered into negotiations with the prison regime in the hope of uh, bringing about a resolution uh, uh, and that the, 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 the prison regime and the British government would see sense that the, the best way out of this would be uh, a resolution that saved face for everyone. But the, the prison regime uh, which you must remember was, you know, 99% unionist as well. I mean, they were hostile politically to us. They didn't want us to be recognized as political prisoners. And they saw this as a, as a massive defeat for us uh, and a great victory for themselves. But once, once we realized that that was the position that they had taken up uh, and that Bobby's attempts at negotiating a resol resolution uh, weren't going to produce a positive result. I mean, we dug in then 
we 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 said, well, you know, uh, okay, uh, the hunger strike failed, but we're going at it again, uh, and everyone, uh, everyone was resolute that we weren't going to be defeated, uh, that we weren't handing the British a victory. And you see, you must remember, part of our psycholo psychology at the time was that we believed the weight of the struggle was on our shoulders and that if we bent the knee it would be a hammer blow to the whole struggle outside if we were seen to be accepting in any way even though you know it would have been us being driven and beaten into accepting a regime that we didn't want to accept in the first place we felt for us to do that would be a betrayal of the struggle, uh, that we needed to remain strong, that we weren't going to bow down or bend the knee. And that was the, that was the mindset uh, moving into the second hunger strike. And, and, and Pat, along similar veins, I'll just ask you, what psychological preparation was involved in that? Or, or was it just kind of you all kind of getting together and saying, look, this is important, or, you know, was, was there any, because that's a big decision, it's a massive decision to willing, willingly lay down your life for your ideals. Yeah. Uh, was, was there any psychological preparation for that? Well, I mean, I think the previous five years had been all the preparation anyone needed. I mean, first of all, I mean, we, we were all political. Uh, I mean, None of us was responsible for the political conditions that existed in this country. Uh, but we, we, we all suffered as, as a result of them. And um, I, I was speaking in the assembly just a couple of weeks ago there after the death of Bobby Story. Uh, Bobby was, was one of our leaders in the army. Uh, he was a, a much revered uh, member of the army uh, he was he he was someone who organized the mass escape from uh, the h blocks in 1983 and maybe i should have uh, uh, mentioned that i'll come back to that in a minute uh, but uh, i described him in the assembly as as being fearless uh, and he was fearless uh, but one of the things about Bobby was that as a young teenage boy uh, in the eruption of the conflict in the late 60s and early uh, 70s, he and his family were driven from their home. Uh, they were, their, their, their home was burnt. Uh, he lived in a unionist area. Bobby Sands lived in a unionist area and his family were driven from their home when he was a young teenage boy. And uh, in 1972, when I was 15, and I lived in a unionist area, uh, unionist uh, gunmen came to kill me. They asked for me by name when my father answered the door. Uh, I wasn't in the house and I opened fire on my father, who luckily escaped injury. But the upshot of it was we had to up and leave our home the very next day. So, you know, we as, as nationalists and Republicans had lived in a state for, for 50 years. I mean, not, not us in person, but our families, our forefathers, our, our fathers, mothers, grandmothers, grandfathers had lived in a state where they were second class citizens, where they were discriminated against in every walk of life, whether it be housing, employment, uh, and so on. Uh, and then when they protested for civil rights, modest reforms of the state, uh, they were met with violence by the state uh, and, and their human rights were abused as well as their civil rights being denied. So that was the context in which, which we as, as, as young teenagers were growing up and, and, and our uh, experience isn't by any means unique. Uh, to young men and women from from nationalist community, 
uh, and we ended up joining the IRA. And I mean, my reason for joining the IRA was to fight against the injustices that existed uh, here in, in this part of Ireland. And when we went into prison and we were faced with the, the brutality and, and the degradation and the humiliation on the, on the blanket protest, I mean, that just reinforced our view uh, about the injustice of the state that we lived in. In many ways, the H-blocks were like a, a microcosm of Northern Irish society uh, on the outside. And, you know, when you believe you're right about something, that's a very powerful motivation. And, you know, when it has been reinforced by five years of brutality and beatings, uh, and all of that in a context of a tradition of, of Irish Republicans using hunger strike as a weapon. I mean, all of that, you know, comes together in almost a perfect storm. Uh, and I mean, I don't know about uh, individual psychology. I, I presume you have to be uh, pretty stubborn in the first place anyway. Uh, our strong world, maybe, it would be a more diplomatic uh, term to use. So all, all of those things, I think, add to your determination uh, to see this through, to end the injustice that you believe exists. And, and, and that was uh, primarily, I think, the mindset that most of us had in the prison at that time. That's great, Pat. Thanks a million. And I, I've another question here is, what was your own personal feeling when the strike ended, when you felt you hadn't actually met at that point in time all of your original objectives? Um, I was, um, I would have to say I was, well, uh, I would have to say that uh, my feelings were divided. Uh, on, on the one hand, uh, I was uh, ecstatic. I have survived the hunger strike, that I was still alive. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I felt demoralized that we hadn't achieved all our objectives. I felt guilty uh, about the, the fact that 10 men had died. Uh, I wondered how their families would feel about us making the decision to end the hunger strike. So I had mixed, mixed feelings uh, at, at that time. I, I would say that probably the year after the hunger strike uh, was probably the most demoralizing period of all the time I spent in prison. You know, we had succeeded in getting some of our demands. You know, for example, we got the right to wear our own clothes, but we were still expected to do prison work and so on. Uh, and uh, we were also expected to integrate with uh, other prisoners, including loyalist unionist prisoners. So, uh, you know, we, we were left in a quandary about what we should do. And we didn't want to make any hasty decisions. So the, the protest actually continued for almost a year after the ending of the hunger strike, when we refused to do prison work. Uh, and we were still segregated from the rest of the prison population. But we were still uh, losing remission. Uh, we uh, didn't get any privileges such as parcels and, and so on uh, while we were there. And uh, we, we came to the conclusion that we had to do something. We just couldn't sit there indefinitely. Uh, and we decided that we would filter uh, groups of people down into what were called the conforming blocks. We were classed as non-conforming prisoners. Uh, if you were on protest, you became classed as a non-conforming prisoner. So what we decided to do was that we would filter uh, groups of, of prisoners down into the conforming blocks. We would establish structures, organizational structures, and we would try to 
uh, raise tension uh, and create mayhem uh, in those blocks. So um, I, in, in, I think it would have been July or August of 1982, I was asked to go on one of these groups uh, and I did and I went down to uh, H1 where uh, I met up with uh, John McGlinchey from South Derry, better known as Chinky, Chinky McGlinchey. And uh, the Loyalists and Republicans were mixed in the conforming blocks. And what we had, what we had learned, I suppose, from the protest was that when we came in the direct confrontation with the British, invariably we lost because the British couldn't be seen to be given in to Republicans. So what we had to do, we believed, was create a situation where the Loyalist prisoners came into conflict with the administration and with the British. And our objective was to create the situation and the conditions where that would happen. Uh, and so, um, Initially, we had an arrangement with the Loyalists. There are four wings in each hitch block. Uh, and there was what was called interwing association. So A and B wing were on one side, C and D on the other. So A and B wing could mix freely. So we had an arrangement with the Loyalists that on one day during association, they would take one wing, we would take the other and the following day we would swap around. So one Sunday afternoon, uh, it was our turn to go from A wing to B wing. And usually what happened, it took maybe 20 minutes or so for the prison guards to get the grills open, to allow people to go, to go across. So you would go into the, the canteen in the wing, get a cup of tea or coffee, and then uh, walk over to the other wing. So a group of us Republicans were in the canteen. The Loyalists would usually wait until everyone cleared before they would come in. And then uh, one of the Loyalists came in to me. I, I had taken over as the, the vice OC in the block and I was in charge of that side of the block. And uh, the Loyalists came in to me and said, listen, the interwing association has been canceled. So, uh, it's our turn for this canteen, so you need to get out. And I said, um, look, listen, if the Interwing Association is off, then all bats are off, and we aren't going anywhere. Uh, and a few try to come in here, there's going to be trouble. So you'd be as well going and speaking to the prison governor and try and get the uh, Interwing Association reestablished. So they went out. Uh, to speak to governors uh, and came back in again <clears throat> and said that uh, the, 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 the OC of the UDA and the UVF came into the canteen and sat at the table with myself and Sean McGlinchey and they said that uh, the Interwing Association wasn't going to be re-established, that there had been an incident in a previous block uh, or in another block the previous evening so Interwing Association was cancelled. I says, well, let me explain the situation to you. I said, we have been locked behind the doors for five years uh, and we're not going back behind them again. I says, in uh, everything, every privilege that you have got here, you have got it off our backs and it's about time you got the finger out uh, and did something yourself. Uh, I said, so that's the situation. If you want to try and come into this canteen, there's going to be a serious row. Uh, and it was left at that. And they went out <clears throat> and had a, a meeting at the bottom of the wing. And the two boys came back in again uh, and sat down. And one of them said to me, I agree with everything you've said. Uh, everything we have got here we did get it off your backs as a result of the protest that 
uh, that you were doing. Uh, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, and there was a lockup at between half four and half five. We said at the, at the half four to half five lockup, we're going into the cells. We're going to wreck the cells. We're going to smash the furniture. And we're going to pour our piss out under the door. Uh, and I said, right, okay. Uh, and that's exactly what they did. And the wing beside us, the loyalists did the same. Later that night, the other side of the block also did the same thing. They wrecked their cells and poured the urine out. And over the next two or three days, uh, all the loyalists and all the other blocks did the same. They were then classed as non-conforming prisoners. We at that point, those of our prisoners who had been left still on protest, who were still classed as non-conforming prisoners, ended their protest. So Republicans then were conforming prisoners and the Loyalists were non-conforming prisoners. They had an issue about segregation. Uh, it was between them and the prison administration and the British government. We were out of the equation. And within six months, that situation was resolved. Segregation was granted uh, within the hitch blocks. And that had been another one of our demands uh, achieved. We still had to do prison work. Uh, and what happened was that uh, most of the prisoners were taken out either and walked to the the prison workshops or taken in buses or, or mini buses. And the prisoners used uh, that opportunity to gather intelligence uh, about the prison, about the changing of guards, about where alarms were located, uh, and so on and so forth. And in September 1983, uh, prisoners in H Block 7, led by Bobby Story, uh, as I told you, uh, mounted uh, the biggest mass escape uh, in, in, in Europe since the Second World War, uh, when 38 prisoners escaped. Uh, and the very next day, uh, the prison administration stopped all prison work. So uh, in, a, in a roundabout way, uh, we achieved all our demands. Now, uh, it wasn't easy, especially in the aftermath of the escape. And the British, uh, the prison administration, backed up by the British, uh, still wanted to try and impose control of, of us, uh, over us. So it was still a very tense uh, situation within the prisons for the next couple of years. By the mid-80s, we had achieved all the objectives we set out to achieve uh, in 1981. That's a long-winded way of answering that question, but I hope it suffices. <laughs> it, it's long-winded, but it's very effective, and thank you so much for that, Pat. Uh, I, I have a couple of other questions I'm just going to ask you, uh, and, and probably more personal. Um, what impact did your decision after your father uh, coming in and asking you to give up your hunger strike ambitions have on your family? Because that's obviously, you know, that's a big deal. It, it's, it's, it's bigger than you, it's impacting your family. And how did you deal with that personally? And what impact did that have on your wider family? Well, uh, first of all, and I said this uh, probably at the outset that when you decide to go on hunger strike, when you have made that decision, it's pretty straightforward uh, and, and, and simple. You have, you have a job to do. It's clear cut. There's no ifs or buts or maybes. Uh, you have one job to do, and that's to stay on hunger strike either until you're dead or you're told to come off it. Uh, and that's straightforward. And I've explained the mindset that you need uh, to do that. The most difficult thing of all on the hunger strike uh, is having to watch your family suffer. Um, 
you know, we had complete control over the decisions that we were making, but our, our families were totally powerless. Uh, they couldn't do anything to stop us. Uh, they couldn't do anything to resolve the protest uh, around the hunger strike. Uh, and they had the job of sitting watching us uh, wasting away and suffering uh, and, and, and all of that. And, you know, some people have said, well, you know, especially in, in the aftermath of, of, of hearing about your sister being ill, that it was very cruel and selfish on your parents to have done uh, what you did. And um, cruel, yes, uh, I, I, I accept that there is, you know, an, an element of cruelty in, in all of that. But selfish, you know, how can going on hunger strike to the death be described as selfish? I mean, it's the complete antithesis of selfishness. You know, you're, you're given your life for the sake of others, for your comrades, for your community, for your friends. Uh, so, uh, it's, it, it, it was a very difficult decision, and, and I know others uh, who initially had put their name forward for hunger strike, who, who later uh, retracted. N not because they weren't prepared to do it, but because they weren't prepared to put their family through that type of suffering. Uh, and, you know, I make, I make no judgment about that uh, whatsoever. Uh, but I was of a mindset, I had already made my mind up about what I was going to do. And there was nothing, there was just absolutely nothing that uh, was going to change it. And, you know, I believe, and I can't speak for, for everyone who was on the hunger strike, but I think if you haven't got that mindset, you couldn't possibly go through with the hunger strike. Uh, and in, in many ways, uh, others suffer the consequence of having that type of mindset, and most notably, the families of, of the hunger strikers suffered, whether they were supportive of the hunger strike or not. And I mean, um, my, my parents would have been uh, Republicans with a small r, they, they, they weren't by any means, they didn't by any means come from a staunch Republican background, uh, strong GAA background, uh, strong uh, supporters of the Catholic Church uh, and so on, as many of that generation would have been. But they, they, weren't, uh, they weren't supporters of the armed struggle, uh, but they did support me uh, when I was in prison and when I was on, on hunger strike. So uh, it was a, it was probably the most difficult aspect of hunger strike and to have to, to watch your family. And I would also have to say there's, there's no small amount of guilt involved in that as well. Yeah, thanks, Pat. That's a, that's a great answer. And I'm gonna, I just thought of another question as you were just finishing that one and uh, it's it's where did your own evolution in terms of you know your your family, in terms of being Republicans but not being active Republicans, your own evolution in terms of becoming an active Republican, uh, what what instigated that? Well, uh, I'm just trying to get a bit of light here so you can see me. Um, yeah, that's great. Is that okay? Yeah, that's perfect. Thanks, Pat. Um, well, I mean, I I grew up uh, as I told you in uh, in a in a unionist area. My my father had been a joiner by trade, a carpenter, uh, and he had gone out on his own. He had a, a, as a small time builder, and he had bought an old ramshackle semi detached house in in a part of. West Belfast, which which was unionist. In fact, when we moved into the street, a street of about uh, 
50 or so houses. There were only two other Catholic families. And by coincidence, both of them were, uh, uh, had been members of the RUC. One was retired uh, and the other one was still serving. Uh, you know, un unusual in itself to have Catholics in the RUC, but two in the one street uh, was even more unusual. Uh, and, and I grew up, uh, all the friends around where I lived were all from the union unionist background. Uh, we grew up uh, actually following orange bands as kids. You know, you're attracted to the color and the, the noise and the music and, and all of that. And I mean, I remember my mother saying, you know, don't be going too far away. Don't be going out of the street and don't be going too far with those bands. And she never said, you know, don't be going near them. They're, they're unionists or they're bigoted or anything like that. Uh, there was never anything like that. It was just, you know, as kids, you're attracted to the music and the color and the din and, you know, everything that goes along with it. Uh, and as I say, all my friends in that area were from that background. But as the, as the, the tension began to raise in the late 1960s, that was, we, we moved in there in 1963. Uh, and as tension began to raise and later in the 1960s uh, and then particularly in the early 70s, uh, all of those friends uh, began to drift away. Now, I had, I went to a Catholic primary school, um, a, a school called St. Gauls. It was located uh, behind Clannard Monastery in, in the Clannard area. Uh, Clannard Monastery was the place that the, the embryonic peace talks began uh, in the late 1980s. But in any event, the school I went to was situated at a right, in a, in a right angle where two other streets met. Uh, and one of those streets was Bombay Street. And in 1969, uh, the, uh, when the trouble really erupted and crowds of loyalists came into the Clannard area, uh, led by the RUC and the B Specials who were an auxiliary police force, uh, heavily armed also. Uh, they led the mobs in and they burnt the whole of Bombay Street to the ground. Maybe, you know, 60 or 70 homes of, of Catholics, of nationalists. And I remember uh, some time later, uh, we used to go to Mass in Clannard and my father brought me down. I. I I actually left the primary school I was at in 1969 in June that year. But my father brought us down after mass to see Bombay Street and just row upon row of, of houses completely got it. Uh, and, you know, my, my views uh, of, of the situation were no doubt um, formed by what was going on around me at the time. Uh, I mean, there was no Republican politics in, in, in our house as, as youngsters growing up. Uh, but a, a few hundred yards from where I lived in 1971, when internment was being introduced in, in August, over three days, 11 people were shot dead just 200 yards up the road from where I lived in Ballamurphy, in what has become known as the, the Ballamurphy Massacre. They, they were shot dead by the British Parachute Regiment, uh, who went on to Derry six months later in January 1972 and killed 14 people there. And all of this was happening around me and internment was happening and I knew lads whose Fathers had been taken away and thrown into long cash. Uh, and uh, I also remember uh, one lad I played football with in school. I was at St. Malachy's College at the time on the Antrim Road. And a guy called Jim Crummy, I would have been very friendly with. We played in the football team together. Uh, he had been 
in the upstairs of a, of a pub, which was a, a, a living accommodation above a pub where the family who owned the pub lived there. And he had been in playing uh, with one of the children from the family. Uh, and loyalists put an old warning bomb into the pub. And 12 people, including Jim, uh, were killed in, in that explosion. So that was the, the, the situation that I was growing up in. And uh, I've already told you about the situation where we had to leave our own home. Uh, and, and, and all those events, no doubt, were having an impact on, on how I saw the world and, and, and how I believed that the state that we lived in was an unjust and unfair state. Uh, and we had seen the example of peaceful protest by civil rights demonstrators uh, being attacked by the state. And, and the culmination of that was Bloody Sunday in Derry in 1972. Uh, and uh, I suppose at that stage, at a very young age, I decided to join uh, Nafina Aaron, which was the youth wing of the IRA. Uh, and, and I joined that. And then when I was older, uh, I enrolled into the ranks of, of the IRA itself. But I would say, I would say, first of all, when I was when I was playing with my young friends, you know, from a unionist background, I mean, I didn't notice anything really different about us, although there were differences. So I played uh, hurling and Gaelic football, and I went to mass on Sunday. They played cricket and rugby and so on, and went to Sunday school. And I remember. One of them said to me one day, why, why don't you come down to Sunday school uh, with us someday? And I mean, I didn't mind school. Uh, I, I, I wasn't bad at school, I enjoyed it. But I liked my weekends off too. And the thought of going to school on, on Sunday didn't appeal to me. But he put that much pressure on me. I went in and asked my mother, would it be all right to go down to Sunday school with Stephen? And she said, uh, listen, son, you go to mass on Sunday morning and Stephen goes to Sunday school on Sunday afternoon. And that's how we'll leave it, you know. So, so there were differences, but, you know, there didn't appear to be conflict. But I always considered myself, you know, as Irish. I never have at any stage in my life considered myself to be, have any sort of connection with Britain. Uh, as I said, yeah, we're steeped in the GAA. Uh, we went to the South for holidays. We looked at Dublin as the capital city. You know, I remember having some arguments with some of my uh, Protestant friends about the capital, the capital city, and they were saying it was Belfast. And I couldn't understand that. I know it, it has to be Dublin. Dublin's the biggest city. But anyway, so those that was a sort of context in which I was growing up and, and, and my views were being formed, very much formed by what was happening around me. Thanks very much, Pat. And it's, it's great to, to hear that last paragraph there. And you're having great discussions with your Protestant friends up in, in Northern Ireland. And it's great to see that dialogue. It's great to see, uh, I suppose, the, 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 the foundation blocks, I, I suppose, of, of peace in our country being formed in uh, 1981 and I truly believe they were um, and great to see us all living in a peaceful 32 counties at the moment. Um, this is the 65th lecture uh, on the Trasson and the Theory series and it's great to have you all involved. Thanks so much for Pat for tuning in from um, uh, the north of our country, giving a uh, nationalist and republican perspective on his experience uh, during the hunger strikes in 1981. So thank you very much, uh, Pat, and we will leave it at that. Gaurav Mila Margo. You're welcome. Thanks very much. All the best.